Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. We received a lot of feedback this past week on a draft proposal calling for more amenities. Think Wi-Fi, bigger RV sites, cabins, even food trucks in National Park campgrounds. And overwhelmingly, readers told us they were opposed to all of that. We also reported on a new national park in Canada, the theft and recovery of a bronze bust of Orville Wright at the Wright Brothers National Memorial in North Carolina, and provided an update on repairs to Scotty's Castle at Death Valley National Park. In this week's show, I visit with the filmmakers behind The Elephant Queen, a beautiful documentary that follows the matriarch of a herd of elephants at Savo East National Park in Kenya as she leads them from a lush landscape during the rainy season through arid badlands to a small oasis and back again. We also discuss an award presented to the traveler by the Western National Parks Association and start thinking about a winter visit to Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. In this ever-seemingly shrinking world, the land and resources that we all share are becoming more and more precious. And making those resources even more valuable are the vagaries of the weather. While some parts of the world are drenched in driving rains, others are mired in drought. The impacts can be deadly, not only to humans, but also to wildlife. Filmmakers Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone drive that home in their latest film, The Elephant Queen. In it, they follow Athena, the matriarch of an elephant herd, as she leads her family from the kingdom, a lush landscape during the rainy season, to the refuge, where a reliable water hole slakes the thirst of not only these elephants, but many others and many other wildlife, from giraffe to zebras to birds. Filmed in part in Savo East National Park in Kenya, the documentary not only focuses on the close-knit elephant herd led by Athena, a 50-year-old elephant queen, if you will, but on the various species of wildlife, from killifish and chameleons to bee-eaters and even dung beetles that benefit from the elephant's presence. This hour-and-a-half film is captivating both for how we come to know the personalities, yes, the personalities, of Athena and her clan, as well as for the many birds, fish, and other animals that rely directly and indirectly on the elephants, and for the sweeping landscape of Savo East National Park. Mark and Victoria join us to discuss this amazing production. Welcome to The Traveler. Hey, thank you. It was very, very thank nice you. to be speaking to you. The Elephant Queen is a beautiful, sweeping film that not only makes a strong connection with these elephants, but also on the many creatures they impact. The interconnections of wildlife, if you will. And it reminds me of the, the Born to Free productions of my childhood with Elsa the Lioness. What what prompted you to embark on such a production? I mean, it was time-consuming eight years in in uh, production in the field. It was just an amazing film you put together. When we started this film eight years ago, our ambition was to tell a story that would reach the broadest possible audience across the world, to inspire the world to fall in love with elephants. It's not a film about climate change. It's not a film about issues. <clears throat> it's a story-driven film to inspire people to to care. And I think the thing is that, that climate change obviously um, drives the, the narrative of the film, as it were. Um, but it's not, you know, we don't, we try not to, to mention it. The idea is to show what's happening because I think we believe very firmly that if people make the connections for themselves, um, you know, so we, we talk about how the droughts are going to become more frequent and worse, you know, and we show the effects of what's happening. Um, but I think if people see that and then they, they make the connection for themselves, then it becomes that much more powerful and has the, you know, has a, the ability to, to really influence them. No, I think you're right. It, it's that old adage, um, show, don't tell, that uh, writers are instructed to do. And it, it clearly comes across in, you know, the 
the shots that your team captured are incredible. I mean, um, not just the sweeping landscape that you, you have to work with, but the, the, the zooming in on the bullfrogs pictured practically under the elephant's feet, um, the interactions between the elephant youngsters, Mimi and Wee Wee, the goslings leaping from their nest to the ground, dung beetles battling. <laughs> How were you able to capture those shots? Well, um, well, Mark actually did all the cinematography. So <clears throat> from underground to in a metal box, to flying a plane and filming. Um, it was just one, just Mark who did it. And really that's why it takes time. We were four years living alongside elephants in the wild with a tiny team. There were about five or six of us actually um, on film work and then a small support team you know, who sort of ran the camp because we were fairly remote and that literally meant things like uh, water were not there, we had to bring it in. Um, and so... Over a lot, you, you've got no support system like that. So we're reliant on ourselves for everything. And, you know, when it came to the, the, you know, the variety of shots, it, it, often it's just about working it out. Um, and, you know, from, from, the, from the aerials, that meant sort of strapping a, a camera to a, a strut of the old Cessna we used to get around. Things like the, the killifish eggs, which actually, I mean, they, they look giant on the screen, but they are tiny in real life. I mean, they're barely, barely a millimetre across. And for that, we'd end up setting up or actually building what's called a macro bench, which is something sort of bolted to a big concrete frame where you actually move the subject rather than the camera. Because any time the camera fans run or something, they, it, it just um, it induces too much vibration in the, in the subject. And, you know, the thing was, we did have four years to work all that out. Um, I think probably what was most more difficult was some of those things like the, the bullfrogs mating we saw only happen once in, in four years. Um, you know, they don't happen every season. They happen when you get you know, enough rain. You need about three or four inches of rain. Um, and then what happens is they come up, you know, they've been estivating underground in their sort of, what they call a sort of summer sleep. And then they pop up to the surface and then they, they mate and lay eggs within, you know, within hours um, and generally all at night. And it was actually trying to capture events like that, which was probably the, the most difficult thing. So we, we followed the elephants for Tina and her family for just under a year. But the actual, you know, the, all the sort of animals, at, which are part of this sort of um, spiral of life that revolves around the elephant, it was actually capturing their, them and their behavior that took most of the time over that other four-year period. You know, you mentioned the, um, the the frogs coming up from hibernation or their summer sleep. I mean, there's this one image of of you, you're focusing on this this muddy ground, and all of a sudden, this bullfrog, I guess, pops up from under it. Um, <laughs> how do you be in the right place at the right time for that kind of shot? Well, you you know you know where they went down, and also you know often what you see is you see because they're they're pretty slow and. You know, they've been underground for a long time. So often you see the ground moving first. You know, that happens both with the bullfrogs. Um, it happens with the terrapins. The fish, of course, aren't, I mean, they're, they're stuck down in the mud. But when they, they basically rely on that sort of the flush of, of fresh water, but also cold water, sort of highly oxygenated water, which has got a lot of tannins in. Um, you know, we're not, we still don't quite know what it actually is that triggers their emergence, but it's a combination of all of all of those various things. Um, and it, it's just it's just about trying to be in the right place at the right time to, to capture that. And that, that is what took the time. And and what about the goslings leaping out of the tree? <laughs> well those those were um those were actually they weren't all the same goslings. We filmed that in you know because we were there for four years. You know, we could get one angle one one year, we could get another angle the next year. And you know, even sometimes we'd have to we'd have to try and get some of the behavior on a, a different nest. Um, you know, because things like, for example, we've got a shot of a um a Lana falcon coming in and and trying to take the goslings. Right. And really just it's a flyby and they would have taken them had the parents not been there. But of course, you know, if you're if you're there around the nest with all sort of filming equipment and towers, then the Lana falcon wouldn't come anywhere near. But if you're down on the ground and you, you've let them all jump, or in this case, two jump out, um, and you're sort of following them as they run over to their parents, and you're not putting off the lana, then you know, then the lana will come in. So it's it's about you know accumulating all those little pieces over over years, and then assembling them into a sequence, um, which hopefully is as seamless as possible. 
Well, it certainly did look seamless, and um, you even had a little fun with the dung beetles and their their battling. I thought that was uh, <laughs> pretty comical, inserted in there with the um, the background voices, if you will. Yeah, well, we wa- we wanted the film to appeal to a really broad audience, not just people who are already you know love elephants or are into wildlife, and also children. And we did a few sort of test screenings with kids. And when we had those voices and with Alex Heffy's wonderful music, they were roaring with laughter. And it just brought that scene to life. Because if you imagine you're telling a story over an hour and a half, you need light and shade, you need humor, you need um, deep emotion, sadness, you need the huge scenes. So it's really just about sort of crafting a story that will 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 show all shades of, of life and not be maybe too serious about it all. I mean, for, for us, this was a really a, a big departure from how we normally make films because, you know, we've made films in the past which are pure natural history documentaries. Uh, we one, made one called The Queen of Trees, which is about, you know, the relationship between a fig wasp and and a fig tree. And, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful story, but it couldn't be more, more sort of serious and... It's factual. It, well, yeah, it's, it's in sort of full of information. Um, whereas this, we wanted to tell a story which was led by the story rather. And when we, it was interesting when we tried to put in more elephant information, you know, just so that people would know more about elephants, we actually killed the story. So we had to really pull back on that. And then um, around the film will be ways in which people can explore if they've become interested more about elephants. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, as a writer, when I'm doing a story, you know, I will go out into the field or I'll go to the, you know, wherever the story is set. And, and watch and and tell it from what I see, basically, and from the interviews that I conduct. And yet for this type of production, I mean, in following the herd on its migration from the kingdom to the refuge and back again, that must have been an incredible challenge in terms of envisioning what you wanted to capture and then going out and being sure that you were in the right place at the right time to capture it. So when we go out, when we start a film like this, we start with the arc of the story. So in this case, it would be the elephants are the providers, they dig the water holes, they form the channels that um, then fill the water holes, they provide the environment and the habitat, um, which affects all the other animals. And then what happens when, in the dry season, the elephants have to go and they leave their neighbours behind? That's literally the sort of simplest structure. So we'll do all the research we can on the different the natural history of all the different animals, and then we'll put the time in the field to see what presents itself, what we see, um, how we can tell that story. And we're kind of working it and evolving it as we see what we get. And then the actual writing of the story in, in detail, we might write certain lines when we're actually filming, but the actual um, crafting of the writing of the story is done during the post-production. I think, I think the, the, the key thing that the Vicky said there was is, is how the, the story evolves, because it is an evolution of a story. And we are, we're there, we, we do nothing else in, the, in that period, and every time, you know, every meal time when we're sitting, you know, in camp and under the, you know, the, and the sort of magnificent Savo skies and that, we, we just talk story. You know, we, we discuss which of the little creatures we think might make the movie. We'll say, well, actually, you know, that dung, those dung beetles were great. They've definitely got to have a part. Um, and it's always sort of trying to tie the characters back into the, the central narrative. So we might see something which we think is extraordinary. But if it doesn't relate to the story we're trying to tell, then then we don't film it. We're talking with uh, filmmakers Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone about their latest production, The Elephant Queen. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at wnpf.org. 
The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. You know, one thing I noticed, Mark and Victoria, as I was watching this, and, and you had me riveted because it's a 90-minute production, and I, and I sat at my computer and I watched it from start to finish without taking a break. But one thing you really captured, I thought, were the personalities of the elephants, from the, the playfulness of Wee Wee to the, the poignant moments where the elephants try to keep Mimi moving, and later when they pause around the skull of an elephant. I mean, so often we're, we're told not to project human qualities on on wildlife and yet these elephants possess some human qualities no yeah i I think they do and i think you know we we discussed this a lot in the making of the film and you know as part of you know my background was as a zoologist and part of that sort of that whole natural history um sort of upbringing is that you should you shouldn't be anthropomorphic when it comes to animals but i think I think more these days that, you know, especially with animals like elephants, it's not necessarily, in my mind, being anthropomorphic. It's more just, you know, we do share common emotions. I think, you know, we spend enough time around elephants, you know, you get to be able to to read them. You can tell whether they're they're happy or they're sad or, and so I think, you know, it's in a way that, that, for me, the whole anthropomorphism question is, is actually quite anthropocentric. Um, and in fact, what, what we were talking about are, are common emotions across the higher animal kingdom. And I'm sure it, it just you know grades out um, towards invertebrates and everything else. But I think I think these are these are common emotions. I think you know to deny them from animals like elephants is, would be to do them a, a real disservice. Now, throughout um, the, the film, we're treated to some incredible aerial shots. I mean, portraying the geese in flight, um, the elephants as they migrate, the, the giraffe, the trails that are left across the landscape that are turned into creeks during the rainy season. Did you capture the, all those from your, your Cessna, or were you using some drones at time? Nearly all of them are from the Cessna. We did, there's a couple of shot, drone shots, but most of them are done with um, Mark on his own filming from the Cessna with a camera on the wing and a little tin can over the lens so that we don't get flies splashed across it while he's getting to the location. And then literally pulling back on a piece of string through the window, watching the shot in a monitor, in, through the monitor, and then actually flying the shot. So, I mean, maybe you should describe no, it. I mean, that's, that's, that's it, exactly. Um, I mean, the thing about Savo is, you know, Savo East, which is where this was filmed, um, is such a vast national park that you need a plane to be able to get around. And we needed to get to get those, you know, iconic weather shots. And, you know, from whether it was a, a you know, a, a big rainstorm or dust. And these things don't, don't happen all that often. Um, and so it's about having the plane ready to go most of the time so we could get down to the, the rough bush strip whenever we needed and get in the air very quickly and, and respond to, to what we felt was coming or what we could see on the horizon. But describe how you might um, <clears throat> use the plane to do a shot. I mean, for example, you know, if we were doing a shot which required a sort of tilt up um, from a a dry water hole to an approaching storm, then you know I get up there and I'd circle around, I'd find the right water hole, put the plane into a bit of a dive, um, and then you know frame up on the water hole, and then once I I got it, I sort of count count to myself, you know the the shot length and perhaps even the you know re- recite the words I wanted to say over it, and then sort of pull up at the end, you know, then the storm warner would be screaming and you'd you'd hold it on the clouds as long as I could, and then before putting the nose down and circling round for another shot, and so in a way, you know, a lot of it is quite old technology, but it's just you know we were there for a long time, and then just before we we left, drones, commercial drones came out, and we did use the drones for for a few shots, and they were great because they could. You know, a bit like a helicopter, they could give us a static overview. Mm-hmm. The thing about drones and elephants is that elephants um, equate the noise of a drone to that of a um, swarm of bees, and elephants hate bees. So with a drone, you've got to be careful to be up high and, and far enough downwind that it doesn't affect the behavior of the elephant. Now, I imagine uh, you know, over the years that it took to put this production together, 
probably not everything went as scripted as you had hoped it to go. Were, were there any big uh-oh moments during the work on this film? Yeah, I think that uh, the fact that we, we started outside um, a national park and we, as we were filming, the elephant crisis um, sort of reached a, a higher pitch and the price of ivory was rising, the demand for it was rising. And we ended up outside the park, literally sharing water holes with poachers. And it reached um, it reached the stage where we were being sort of completely drawn into it. We were having injured rangers being brought into camp. Our assistant director, um, Etienne, had to fly two of them out on one incident. Um, one of them died in the plane. So we were right at the heart of the developing crisis. And it was becoming impossible to film the elephants. Um, so we actually decided, that's when we decided we have to go and work in the park. And what was um, sad but fascinating is that the, the minute those elephants were in an area that they felt protected, they relaxed. And you, were, you could have the same elephant who would be completely unapproachable outside the park. It, it seemed like a totally different character inside the park. Wow. Wow. Yeah, now, certainly, um, drought is something that the weather delivers to us. Um, wherever we live. Um, I live in the Southwest and, you know, we just came out of a long running drought. Are, are things getting worse in terms of drought in, in Africa and Kenya? I think, I think they are. I think, I think what's happening is that, you know, we, where we used to have droughts and everybody say, well, this is one in a lifetime or once in, in 50 years, these droughts are now becoming more and more frequent. Um, I think the you know, we, have, we used to have a very stable weather pattern in, in East Africa of sort of long rains and, and then a period of, 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 um, of dry, dry season, then short rains. And these, you know, you could almost, within a few days, you could predict when, you know, when the rains would come. And that's now all starting to change. I mean, it's not that they don't come, but they are, you know, they're, they're later perhaps, or they come earlier. Sometimes, you know, they're hugely intense. Other times, you know, they're, they're sporadic. And so I think the, the variability um, of the rains, I think the frequency of the droughts and the severity of them is is increasing. Um, and you know, I mean, in in somewhere like Sabo, which is a really sort of arid country, I mean, it used to be called the Taru Desert. Um, a lot of the animals are adapted to cope with these extreme dry periods, but I think what, what they're not adapted to cope with is if they happen, you know, one one on the heels of of, of the other. Um, so we are we're definitely seeing seeing change. But also what's happening with that change is that um, the human wildlife conflict is becoming more intense because mm -hmm. the areas that do have water or do have um, grass or, you know, good, good pasture is, is needed by both people and elephants. So there's more potential for um, conflict. And, you know, that, that isn't good for anybody because um, it, it's usually the elephants that suffer in the long run. Yeah, what what is the long run from from your experience there and what you're seeing? Are we going to lose elephants eventually, or or will they adapt to these changing conditions? I, I think you know, to to some extent they're they're adapting and and that's good. But I think what's so important is that you know national parks are a real refuge for the for the species. I mean, it doesn't mean that. That they they don't occur outside, and they do. And in fact, you know, a great percentage of the population is outside the national parks. But I think the national parks provide these these sort of refuges where they can retreat to in times of of hardship. Um, and I think that that that's incredibly important. I mean, the thing is, there are things that are going to get worse. I mean, things like human wildlife conflict will will increase. There's there's obviously you know massive sort of burgeoning population pressure on on both wildlife and national parks um, and in somewhere like Kenya what I think what what really helps is if um, the spatial planning is is really put in place so that you know so that elephant corridors are maintained um, and you know that that works for basically for for you know wildlife and and people and and their livestock yeah because I think it's very important it's quite perhaps easy to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, fine, well, we just have lots of small national parks everywhere. But that's, that's sort of more, that, that isn't the answer. Elephants need to move. They need different uh, places in different seasons for water, for food. 
And so, as Mark said, these corridors um, are absolutely vital to their survival. And also, I think the notion of having them in sort of small protected areas, you have to be careful that you're really still talking about um, wildlife. Mm. Uh, somewhere like Sabo is amazing. It's huge. It's the largest national park in, in Kenya. And it's, I mean, it's, it's something like the size of Massachusetts. I think it's about 14,000 square kilometers. But you know, even then, the elephants want to go outside the park. You know, sometimes it's for water. Sometimes it's for food. Sometimes it's because there are areas which they've been going to for millennia, and they still have that draw to go there. Um, but I think what's important is for us, especially, is that this film makes a difference on the ground in, in Kenya. Um, and, you know, it's about trying, because a lot of people are, are fearful of elephants. A lot of people, you know, if, you, if you're born and grown up in a, or raised in a city in Kenya, you've probably got less, you probably know elephants less than somebody, you know, in, in, in New York, um, just because you don't have access to the films and the books and that. So part of what we want to do is, is to really make a difference, you know, in Kenya, um, for elephants with this film. And to that end, we've got a, a big education and outreach project. Um, you know, we're translating the film into, into Kiswahili and the, the Ma language. Um, and we're going to take it back in with a, a traveling, a traveling roadshow, a, a cinema, if you like. And at the same time, because, because people know so little about elephants and the, and the smaller creatures that rely on them and that whole um, circle of life, what we're doing is we're, We've got a working with the Kenyan government. We're producing um, a series of 28 learn to read books, which will introduce people right from the very start, right from, the, from when they start to read into the characters and into environmental and, and conservation um, driven ideas. So it's about it's about learning to read and and, you know, and having to do the dung beetle or um, Mimi the elephant or Athena you know, as your friends right from the, the very start. One one of the when we've done a couple of test test screenings in Kenya, and one of the reactions we have, which I think um, exemplifies the importance of showing the film throughout, you know, as widely as possible, there, is a woman who said afterwards, um, "You've completely changed my consciousness about elephants through this film. I used to fear them. I used to hate them. I didn't want them. I didn't see why we needed them. I I just." found them, you know, something that we didn't want to include, um, it, it, I didn't want to include in, in my life. And she said, I, you have totally turned my whole feeling on its head. I now realize that I, I, I own some land in central Kenya. I'm going to take down part of the fence. I'm going to welcome them. I'm going to learn to understand them more. I'm going to learn to live alongside them. And for us, you know, our original ambition was to reach the broadest possible international audience with uh, an emotional story, but also to make a difference on the ground. And when you get feedback like that, it really makes eight years feel worthwhile. I'm sure. I'm sure. And as far as that outreach and education, um, you're also going to have a website out there, right? The Theelephantqueen.com? That's right. And um, Apple are, are working on that at this very minute, and it will be up and running with the release of the film. And also that will give... Because, you know, part of the drive behind this is not really to deal with the issues within the film, but to make people think and, and connect and come to love elephants. But what we also want to do is then um, provide somewhere at the end of the film, where if people are concerned, then they, they know where to go um, and they know where they can go to help elephants or find out more about them. Where can folks see this film? It will be in select cinemas on the 18th of October. And then on Apple TV Plus from the first of November. So we, we have a we have a Facebook page which is probably the main the main portal for it, and that's um, at the Elephant Queen movie. And um, if people go there, then that will keep them up to date with with what's going on. And also there, it has a list of all the, the cinemas in the US in which it will be shown. Great, great. We've been talking today with filmmakers Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone about their newest production, The Elephant Queen. Um, it's definitely a, a film you don't want to miss in terms of really understanding elephants and seeing the impact they have on the landscape in Africa. Mark and Victoria, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been an incredible conversation and uh, you have an incredible film out there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you for fun. inviting us.
The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, non-profit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnpf.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Kurt, we've had some great news this past week about the National Parks Traveler because you have been selected for the 2019 Western National Parks Association Stuart L. Udall Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It was uh, deeply appreciated and, and quite unexpected. So for people who don't know, the Western National Parks Association uh, has been in partnership with the National Park Service since 1938, and their goal is to advance education, interpretation, research, and community engagement to ensure that national parks are valued by everyone. So have you worked with WNPA before? No. What's really great about them is they support more than 70 parks across the West, and they, they really do a lot. They develop products, they develop services, and they develop programs that enrich the, the visitor experience. And of course, they also give the Stuart L. Udall Award. So what was it about you and your role as editor of National Parks Traveler that drew their attention? Well, I think it's just the, um, the diversity of, of news and features that we try and provide across the national park system. And, and I want to make it clear that... Um, this award, I think, goes to everybody who has contributed to National Parks Traveler over the years. And that includes you, Erica. I couldn't do this by myself. It's an incredible undertaking. And um, sometimes I question my sanity in doing it because, you know, there is 419 units in the national park system. And trying to, to cover them all is an uh, impossible task. And um, Hopefully, um, this will just generate more interest in the traveler and, and more reader and listener donations so we can expand our staff and, and do more, um, more coverage of, of all the parks out there because there are so many incredible stories to tell. Absolutely. And so for people who also don't know, Stuart Udall was on their board of directors from 1984 to 1994. So the award that, the award that was established in his honor really goes to towards people and organizations whose work boosts park interpretation programs, carries the park message to popular audiences, and rallies broad public support for the parks. And so, to me, one of the best parts about the National Parks Traveler is we write for everyone, you know, all age groups, all regions, all across the country. Is this something that you're hoping to continue to expand into the future? Oh, absolutely. You know, this year we added podcasts, weekly podcasts. Um, back in mid-February, we started the, the weekly shows and um, we've had um, great reception to them. We've had over 37,000 downloads of these programs. It's just one more format that we use to, to educate and inform people about the national parks. And so, again, this award is really for people whose work encourages general audiences to learn more about the parks. Why do you think it's important to have outlets like the National Parks Traveler that can tell an outsider's perspective about the national parks, but also from the perspective of people who deeply love them? You know, one thing that we have to realize is that media is under incredible pressure. Rise of the internet and Google and Facebook and other outlets has really been a demise of sorts for, for media. And so the newspapers are falling by the wayside. Magazines have smaller space to, to tell stories. Environmental reporters are being let go. And so what The Traveler tries to do is 
is fill that niche. And, and as we do every day of the year, we try and bring fresh content about the parks to the readership out there to educate them and inform them about what's going on, because obviously a better educated public can build more support for the national parks and the National Park Service and, and use that support to you know, let Congress know that these are incredibly important places that we really need to preserve and take care of. And so I think outlets like National Parks Traveler, which you know, focuses solely on national parks and protected area, really does play a, a key role in keeping the American public informed. This award was named for their board member, but obviously uh, Udall also served as the Secretary of the Interior from 1961 to 1969 and was really known for expanding the, the national park system. You know, he oversaw four new national parks, six new national monuments, eight new national seashores and lakeshores, nine national recreation areas, you know, and the, the list goes on and on. So if you could be Udall for a day, is there an area that you would like to see enter the system? You know, that's a good question, Erica. And and there certainly are some very worthwhile places across the country that that deserve protection under the National Park Service, National Park System umbrella. That said, um, we also have to get after the, the maintenance backlog um, that the National Park Service faces. You know, $12 billion is no small amount of money. And by having to divert revenues to try and whittle away that maintenance backlog really deprives the Park Service and their staff of incredible funds that could be used um, for other programs to enhance the visitor's experience in the national parks. And so while I do believe there are areas out there that should be um, added to the national park system, we also need to pay attention to the, the financial aspect of running the parks. Well, congratulations again on winning the 2019 Western National Parks Association Stuart L. Udall Award. Very well deserved. And you'll be picking that up in early November in Tucson, Arizona. That's right. November 7th, I'll be down there and uh, be great to, to meet their board of directors and talk about the great work that they do as well in creating and providing interpretive materials that uh, so many people enjoy in the, in the national parks here in the West. That's great to hear. Well, congratulations again, and thanks for speaking with us about the award. Thank you. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. What's in a name? Would Bryce Canyon National Park be as popular if it was known as Temple of the Gods National Park? That was the preference of the Utah legislature back in March 1919, when it called upon Congress to set aside for the use and enjoyment of the people a suitable area embracing Bryce's Canyon as a national monument under the name Temple of the Gods National Monument. Whatever the name, more than likely, this small national park in southern Utah would still be a big draw. Though covering fewer than 36,000 acres, you can find lots of space and solitude at Bryce, as most folks simply gaze down into the Red Rock Abyss. Take a hike down into the amphitheaters from the trailheads at Ponderosa Canyon or Rainbow Point, and you'll leave most, if not all, the others behind. Visit during a weekday in late spring or fall, and your odds of being alone with this astonishing landscape go up. One look at the rumpled and jagged creamsicle-colored topography of this national park, and you'd likely agree that a picture is worth a thousand words. Or more. 
Time, wind, and water have so artfully sculpted from the Ponsagon Plateau's vibrantly painted topography an open-air geologic art museum. 65 million years in the making, and still under construction, the cliffs around Bryce once were muds, clays, and silts on the bottom of a freshwater lake that flooded much of southwestern Utah. Whimsical as the hoodoos that stand in phalanxes in the park's amphitheaters are, they also are towering examples of geology. And they also spur the imagination. How else would they gain the names such as Thor's Hammer, Queen's Garden, E.T., Indian Princess, and The Warrior, just to name a few? Now, a strong argument can be made that winter is a more fascinating time to visit this red rock icon. The sharp contrasts between fresh fallen snow, cerulean skies, and the park's red hued amphitheaters are spectacular. But you need to prepare carefully. Winters at 8,000 feet are cold and snowy. That means there are a lot of outdoor activities to partake in, but you have to be dressed properly for them. Winter equates with solitude at Bryce Canyon. It's not difficult to find yourself alone on the upper Inspiration Point overlook. You can enjoy far view point by yourself, walk the Queen's Garden Navajo Loop Trail alone with your thoughts. Watch the sun ignite Bryce Point with its early morning glow with just a few other hardy souls. Of course, winter weather can be mercurial at Bryce. One morning you might awake to 5 degrees below zero, the next to 19 degrees above zero. One afternoon's high temperature of 30 degrees might be followed the next day by 40 degrees. If you do visit in winter, consider a full moon snowshoe hike with a ranger. These events held November through March, when there's more than 12 inches of snow on the ground, are free and open to a limited number of visitors. Get a ticket at the Parks Visitor Center. Tickets are available at 8 a.m. the day of the hike, and go quickly. Sometimes the line starts forming at 7.30 a.m. If you feel this is a mandatory activity, check the schedule of full moon hikes on the park's website and plan your visit accordingly. And hope for clear skies. Snowshoeing isn't the only winter activity at Bryce Canyon. There are roughly 30 kilometers of groomed cross-country ski trails, most surrounding the park and adjoining national forest lands. However, there also are a small number of cross-country ski trails in the park. Skis, as well as snowshoes, can be rented at Bryce Canyon City, just north of the park entrance if you don't have your own. If you do join a ranger for a snowshoe hike, the snowshoes are free to use, but you won't be allowed to participate if you're wearing tennis shoes or street shoes. Your feet just won't stay warm in those. These activities are a great way to see another side of Bryce Canyon, the forested one, and get some exercise at the same time. If you do visit Bryce Canyon in winter and there is snow on the ground and blue sky overhead, the one hike you absolutely must take is the Queen's Garden Navajo Loop Trail. Let's have no quibbling over this choice. While Bryce Canyon Rangers like to call it the best three-mile hike in the world, we'll settle for the best three-mile hike in North America when there's snow on the ground and blue sky overhead, and in the top five come warmer seasons, dropping only slightly in stature due to that lack of a snowy contrast. Why is this trail so highly regarded? The surreal scenery. Cross-state neighbor Arches National Park has the world market cornered on stone arches, but we have yet to find a park that can compete with Bryce Canyon when it comes to hoodoos. Sorry, Goblin Valley State Park, but while you have scores of hoodoos and goblins, their stone makeup is far duller than that on display at Bryce Canyon. The Queen's Garden Navajo Loop Trail can take as little as two hours out of your day, or three hours or more, depending on how much you like to dawdle, compose photographs, or just soak in the landscape. In winter, you'll begin this trek from the parking lot at Sunset Point. After leaving your car, walk north a short distance along the rim trail overlooking Bryce Amphitheater to Sunrise Point in the Queen's Garden Trailhead. From here, you'll descend into an otherworldly landscape. For roughly three miles, the trail meanders down and up and back down again, leading you through some stone passageways and cruising along the canyon floor before finishing uphill through a narrow divide that is given height not only by the embracing stone walls, but by Douglas fir trees reaching for any sunlight that can pierce this slot. In between the start and finish of your hike, you are led through a Crayola-colored landscape, both whimsical and artful, one that sparks the imagination, questions gravity, and reaffirms your faith in mom nature for her creative genius. 
It seems there is a fantastic view everywhere you turn. While you might want to hike this trail clockwise, so as to ascend instead of descend the slippery slope near the end of the trail by Thor's hammer, it wouldn't be a bad idea to hike this trail in both directions if you have the time. That way you wouldn't miss any of the curious and interesting angles in the landscape that gain perspective depending on the direction of your hike. Once you've enjoyed your visit to Bryce Canyon, you just might want to follow it up with a trip to nearby Zion National Park, which is less crowded during the winter months than in summer. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we'll be visiting with Professor Linda Bilmes, the Daniel Patrick Monaghan Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She, along with John Loomis, a professor at Colorado State University, took a hard look at the finances of the National Park Service and came up with a book, Valuing U.S. National Parks and Programs, America's Best Investment. She and Professor Loomis have some interesting ideas for shoring up the financial end of running the world's best park system. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.